All right, uh, so such blocking, very concurrency, wow. That's uh, what we're going to talk about. Um, so the, the slides are going to be pretty dense today. I'm going to talk about uh, a lot of material. So if you guys, I mean, yesterday when I was sitting here, I had internet. So if you guys want to pull this up on your laptop or iPad or whatever, you can pull this up. It's this link. Um, it's basically my name and then SBVC, such blocking, very concurrency. So you can pull that up and follow along. So like uh, Jonathan says, I work at Engineard. It's a, a company that basically provisions stuff like uh, Windows Azure and Amazon and provides you with a, a ready stack to use your application with. So you just, it's basically similar to uh, Heroku and other platforms as a services that you just push your application there, similar to Google App Engine as well. You just push your application and then it, it kind of works. But I'm not going to talk about uh, Engineer today. <coughs> I'm going to talk about cats. Um, and because every tech talk needs a cat. And actually, the other day when we were at that beer um, tap place, um, Jonathan said that we should put a, every tech talk needs a cat in it. So I put some images here for you to enjoy. There's a cat. There's another cat. <laughs> All right, well, I, I really want to talk about uh, scaling because this is ScaleConf, so it's actually not going to be related to EngineYard. What I want to talk about is uh, scaling and concurrency. <coughs> so really, what, what is scaling, right? We have a certain set amount of time to, to do something. We have these things that we need to do, and then we need to do more of them, and that's what scaling is, right? So scaling is really doing more things at, at once. So when I... Uh, was invited to come here, I decided, okay, I'm going to talk about all the ways you can do more things. Okay. I'm going to talk about all the, the, talk about all the things uh, that you can do and to, to accomplish this goal, to do more things. So I'm going to map them all out, right? And I decided to talk about concurrency and parallelism because apparently they're different. And I kept on kind of looking into it and I realized, well, there's like a ton of, of models that wasn't really going to put me off. I was going to talk about all the things. And there's just a ton of calculus and all these, you know, mathematical models, and it just keeps on going and going and going. So I decided, you know, maybe I'm not going to talk about everything in depth, but I do, I do want to to talk about concurrency models. So what I ended up uh, deciding on is I'm going to kind of do a tour of the different models that exist, and I'm going to talk about <coughs> some general concepts that all these models kind of share, and then I'm going to go through some of the models and talk about them and kind of iterate some advantages and disadvantages that each one of these things have. And then I'm going to let you sit with it uh, in your own head and figure it out because really this is a huge subject. Um, it's, I'm surprised myself that I put all this information in one, in one presentation because really even one specific model you can spend a whole lifetime on, right? This is, this is a really big subject and so I'm um, going to leave it for you guys to, to dig in further. So I talk about, uh, start with the, the general concepts, which are the common ingredients that all these models share. And what I've kind of mapped it out to is, is the following things that I'm going to start uh, just diving into. So concurrency versus parallelism are apparently different, right? So what, what is the difference? I found this uh, on the internet, it says, on the Haskell blog. And it says, not all programmers agree on the meaning of the terms parallelism and concurrency. They may define them in different ways or do not distinguish them at all. And so I decided, okay, well, let's ask the authority figures what, what is going on. And so Rob Pike you know, created Go, who's a pretty good authority figure for concurrency, says that concurrency is about dealing with a lot of things at once, and parallelism is about doing a lot of things at once. And they're, they're similar, but they're a little different. And he basically talks in this, um, this talk that he gave in San Francisco. It's a really good talk, and I'm going to have resources and links that you guys can check out on the slides. But he basically says that concurrency is, is structuring your, programming, uh, your program to do more things whereas parallelism is, is the fact that it happens a lot at once. And so the other authority figure I decided to ask was Monty Python figures, and actually it was Joe Armstrong. Um, so Erlang is another uh, highly concurrent language, and he says when concurrency is two queues, one coffee machine, and parallelism is two queues, two coffee machines. That's how he decides to explain it to a five-year-old. It's, it's a similar concept. You can see parallelism is is happening at the same time, whereas concurrency is just a way you structure it to have two lines happen at the same time. But you still only have this one, one coffee machine. And so the way that, that it made sense to me was that parallelism is really a condition that arises when two things are happening literally at the same second. So for example, if you run two processes or two threads on a multi-core computer and they're executing at the same second, that's parallel. Whereas concurrency is kind of, is, it's almost like a superset of parallelism. It doesn't have to be parallel, but it can be. And that's, it's not entirely true because 
some I've I've also read that some people say that there's you know there are certain things that are parallel and not concurrent, but I think it's more of like a philosophical programming kind of debate thing. So, so operating system mechanisms are we have things that we need to execute to do work, right? So how do we execute these things? So really, it's just threads and processes, right? There's not there's not much else to it. You have a regular operating system process, um, a Linux task, and you have threads, native operating system threads. Again, same thing, but they, they just uh, share memory instead of being contained, uh, self-contained. And then there are green threads and virtual machine processes. These are basically kind of user-level threads that are done within the virtual machine that you're running or the interpreter. And they're, they're similar to regular threads, except they, they're not on the operating system level. And for the purpose of the talk, I'm just going to really uh, split it into processes and threads. And the reason I put uh, Leonardo DiCaprio there is because it's a virtual machine process. It's a process within a process, so it's kind of like Inception. <laughs> so scheduling. So we have these, these executing things, right? Processes and threads is, is what I'm going to refer to now as an executing thing. And these executing things need to be scheduled. So how, how do they run? Like, when do they run? So there's really only two ways you can, that this is usually done, right? There's the preemptive way, and then there's the cooperative way. And the preemptive way <coughs> is basically saying we reserve the right to attack anyone at any given time. So basically anything can happen, right? You have one thing that's running, and then who knows what happens, who knows how long has passed, something else gets invoked at the same, uh, you know, um, immediately. And so that's, you know, interrupts are uh, preemptive, and, and scheduling threads and operating system are preemptive, and that's preemption. Whereas the cooperative uh, way of, of scheduling is basically it's kind of handing off the baton to something. It's like Fred is running, Fred is doing all this stuff, and then he stops, he pauses, and says, okay, I'm done, it's now your turn to do something. And then Joe picks up the baton and starts, you know, making hot potatoes or something, stops, when he's done, he passes on to Harry, and then the circle kind of goes around. But they're all, they're all working together, right? and this is the cooperative way of scheduling. So really, what, what this is, is that it relies on the program or the thing that's running, the executing thing that's running, to, to say, I'm done, it's now your turn. So this is probably the, the most important um, kind of common ingredient that all these things share, because really, we have all these things that are executing. They're running either preemptively or cooperat cooperatively or whatever. But they, they need to coordinate between them what's happening, right? Because they're all doing work with the same stuff. So how do, they, how do we make sure that these things don't trip over each other. This kind of leads me into the concept of uh, atomicity. And atomicity is basically the, the fundamental reason of why concurrency is hard, right? This is the reason that, that you know, people do PhDs on this stuff. And it's because things are not atomic. And the reason that it can create havoc is because if you, you look at that example right there, you'll see you know, the first thread is trying to increment a variable, right? In this case, we want two threads to increment a variable. The first thread is going to read the variable from RAM. It's going to push it into the CPU, into some CPU register, make the calculation to, you know, up it by one, and save its local stack. And then the other thread pr gets preemptively scheduled. It reads the variable from RAM, and if you can see, the first thread hasn't written it back to memory yet, so it reads it, and it's zero. And then uh, the first thread writes it back to, to RAM. The second thread uh, picks up from where it's left. It increments it. It's one. And it pushes it down to RAM, and it's, it's one. Whereas, in reality, this should have been two, right? That's a serious problem, because you can't trust your programs doing what you're doing. It's, it's bad, right? And um, yeah, it's really bad. People can die. So the way that you commun these things communicate with each other is um, there are really two kind of main ways to do it. One is, is shared memory. And shared memory is basically writing some state or some value to uh, you know, a variable in, in RAM, basically. And then the other executing thing looks at that and decides what it, it, what it needs to do according to that value. Right? And that's shared memory, and it's a pretty efficient means of passing data between, between these executing things. The other way is through message passing. And this is a, we'll get to it later, but message passing is essentially, instead of invoking a certain function um, that needs to be done, you, you pass the message of what needs to be done to some kind of proxy, and then that thing decides to, you know, it could either be invoked uh, automatically, you know, at the same time, or it could be done later, or whatever. But the, the idea of message passing is that you don't directly invoke something, you just tell something to happen. And, um, and channels is kind of a subset to me. It's a subset of, of message passing, except that your interface is through a stream. So instead of uh, you having to, like, send a certain message and, and have to deal with that, your API is basically like a file. And this is pretty, pretty cool because if you think about like the Unix paradigm of everything as a file, you know, having a, a file stream API for message passing is, is nice. 
So we're well, going to talk about the model. So those were kind of the, the, the general concepts that we're going to use to try and categorize all these different things in a way that, that hopefully will be easier to kind of grasp and then go deeper you know, on your own time. So this is the, the link again, um, because the slides are going to be you know, pretty dense. Um, if you haven't pulled it up, you're welcome to pull it up now. So uh, this is the, this table that took me quite a while to put together. And it's trying to take all these, uh, these things that, that we've talked about and trying to classify all of the, the models that, that we have. And I'm going to uh, iterate through every one of these. And you'll see, you know, the, um, you'll see this, the, the table kind of row on the top. So you can refer to that as to when I continue going along. So uh, threads and mutex is, is, is the pretty, you know, uh, pretty fundamental kind of concurrency thing that you do. I'm pretty sure most of you guys know it. I, yesterday, I, I noticed that most of you are back-end developers. So I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with most of, the, most of these things. Um, but threads and mutexes, I'm, I'm sure, is probably pretty, pretty so something you're pretty familiar with. So, so again, how do we deal with like, the atomicity problem? right? How do we make sure that data doesn't corrupt it? Well, use a mutex, right? Use a lock. And um, I'm just going to the table on the top right there, you can see. So this uses uh, threads and mutex is kind of the name of this, this pattern. Um, it uses threads, right? And it's, it's preemptively scheduled because operating system threads are preemptively uh, scheduled. And it uses shared memory as a means to communicate. Um, and it does it through locks, but uh, with locks. But um, shared memory is kind of the, the method of communication. And it's concurrent and parallel. That's what those, that CP thing means. It means you can run it literally at the same time on a multi-core computer. And um, all of these models are concurrent, so it's really a question if it's parallel, uh, parallel or not. And then mutex is an example for this pattern. So how do we deal with uh, atomicity? Well, we just use a mutex, right? We lock around. We have that uh, incrementing thing that we want to make sure equals 2 at the end. So thread 1 tries to increment that counter. And then thread 2 tries to increment it, but it can't access that shared data because there's a lock around it. And so when it reads that variable from RAM, it will equals 1. And then it, in the end, when it's done, it'll be tw 2, and that'll be good, right? That's what we want. So some uh, you know, pros and cons. It's the biggest advantage is that it's, it's really, I mean, if you're on any platform, you have threads and mutexes. It's, it's everywhere. It's pretty common. Um, as a programmer, you, know, you, you, you get familiarized with it pretty much in the beginning. It's uh, a pretty common pattern. And that's, that's an advantage, because there's a lot of resources around it. But uh, you know, disadvantage is, is that because you have to deal with locking, you run into all these issues of you know, live lock and, and deadlock. And you know, if you have one thread waiting on another thread, then they just, it stalls, and your computer crashes, and you see the blue screen. Right? That's, that's basically uh, deadlock. So the next uh, model is threads and transactions. And it's similar to uh, threads and mutexes, but it, it works a little differently. It's kind of actually like a database transaction. So essentially, this uses threads. It's preemptive. And it uses shared memory. But instead of using locks, it uses a commit abort semantic. And STM is shared uh, transactional memory. And that's kind of the, the uh, paradigm that's used. And um, so like I said, it's, it's basically like a data, uh, database transaction. And essentially, dealing with atomicity is done by, by explicitly saying, this is an atomic block. And then when it needs to commit, when it needs to write to memory, it checks to see if, it, if the data hasn't changed. And if it can, it'll commit that, that data. And if it doesn't, then it won't commit that data, and it'll roll back. And all the computation that it's done will be reversed. Well, nothing will be written, basically. So it can abort at any time. It can roll back. This is very similar to database transactions. And so this is kind of the example of if we're iter uh, iterating a variable. So we would read it. And then we kind of surround, that's not it. Uh, we surround the, the block of code that we would need to be atomic in this like atomic block. And then either it will get written or it won't get written. And what's, what's nice about this is that you know, instead of locking, if you lock around a big data structure, the other thread might need to wait. Whereas in reality, if the, let's say he was only changing one specific member of that data structure, you don't need to lock, right? You've just you've wasted resources on trying to lock. And when in reality, you, if we would have used STM, two of the things could have done it at the same time, and they both would have committed. So it's kind of like it's an optimistic approach because it, it goes into it takes into account that you know you can do all this stuff that you might be waste, you might be waiting on for, for no reason. So the the that's kind of you know one advantage is that it's it's a little bit increased concurrency in compared to threads and mutexes, and. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have much experience with this, but um, they, they, you know, they say that there's it basically STM kind of composes a little better. So if you have two abstractions that use 
uh, threads and mutexes and you try to join them into another abstractions, you still might need to, to use locking to kind of not step over each other, whereas uh, STM is supposed to compose a little better. Uh, you can look at that link if you want to dig into that a little more. Um, but the, the, dis the main disadvantage for STM is that because you have rollbacks, you can't actually guarantee that a chunk of code is going to complete because it could roll back. So that's, that's a disadvantage, you know, if you have some operation that needs to complete no matter what, you know, you, you, you have to make sure that there's a possibility that you, that might not happen. Okay, so uh, futures and promises, these also uh, this use threads, and uh, this is kind of a, somewhat of a cooperative scheduling, and it, it's, it's a little bit of a funky, funky pattern in terms of the categorizations that I've, I've tried to use. <laughs> it doesn't fit in perfectly, but um, it's a, it's a cooperative model. It uses message passing as in what you're calling the future and the promise is, is the message. And, um, and it's parallelizable because it uses threads. And um, some examples are, are data flow and OS variables, or OS programming language and data flow variables. And this is kind of an example. You can, you can see that um, what we do is we say, you know, pinger dot, so this is, you know, a pinger and a ponger, right? We want to make sure that these two executing things can communicate back and forth. And so we'll have a pinger, you know, dot future and that future is a reference to something that is executing in the background. And then we can do whatever we want, and then when we call value, we, we block until we either get that value, or if it has already completed, we're just gonna continue, continue through it, right? And that's a future, and a, a future is the reference to something that's going to be evaluated, and then the promise, or sorry, that's the promise, and then the future is the, that value, right? And so it's cooperative because this thing is, is basically pausing until that other thing is done, right? And it, it uses message passing because that, that reference to that variable is, is, that me is that message, right? So it, what's nice about this is it kind of abstracts the, the notions of locks away. So you as a programmer don't really have to deal with locks. All you do is use futures and promises and that abstraction of, oh, am I gonna step over myself is, is hidden because of the framework of, of promises and futures. And um, the, d the disadvantage is similar to locking, which I didn't actually put there, but essentially, you know, if you're not ready to, to get that data back, like you're gonna block and you're basically wasting time blocking on that future's value if it hasn't completed yet, right? So uh, processes and inter-process communication is actually, I, I was, when I was putting these slides together, I was thinking, oh, maybe I should put this before threads and mutexes because this is, this is really the like, canonical, oh, I wanna do more things at once, I'm just gonna run another process of this thing, right? And inter-process communication uses processes, it's preemptive, because just like uh, threads, the operating system can run any process at any given time. And um, it, I put shared memory because you could use shared memory with processes, but really it's about message passing. And, um, so how do, we, how do we handle the problem of, of atomicity with processes? Well, we just, we don't share memory, right? And then we don't really have to think about uh, what happens, you know, how are we gonna make sure that the, that the, sh the thing that we're trying to access, uh, that shared thing, is gonna be okay. Well, we just don't share anything. And if we don't share anything, then we're all good, right? We don't have to, we don't have to worry about that. But then we run into the issue of, well, how do we communicate? Well, let's pass message, uh, let's pass messages. Right? And so I uh, take the opportunity to say, well, message passing, the IPC is, is heavily used with, with channels, right? Like sockets and pipes and all this stuff is basically message passing through channels. And um, I found this quote, which, which I, I liked a lot, and uh, I'll just read it. Uh, passing data through a channel to a receiver implies transfer of ownership of the data. It's really important to, to kind of grasp that because what you're doing is by passing a message to, uh, through a channel to someone, or actually just message passing, you're saying, well, this shared thing that we need to both, you know, uh, mutate or whatever, well, it's now your turn. It's now your turn to do something, I'm done with it. And that's how we, we know that, like, if we did have an atomicity problem, well, we're communicating by saying, it's, it's your turn now and I'm done. Like, you can increment that variable and I'm not gonna, you know, I've already written it to memory, for example. So anyway, regarding uh, processes and IPC, so pipes, I mean, every time you open a shell, you're using inter-process communication and channels. And uh, yes, yeah, some pseudocode, you could do something like this, right? The internet is processes and IPC. It's a huge concurrent system. It's just kind of cool. Um, so some pros and, and cons. Uh, again, you, you're, you don't share any memory, so you can't corrupt it. It's pretty easy, and because you have this this uh, this advantage, you know, you don't have to deal with locking, so you don't have any of the problems with locking. And uh, the really biggest advantage with this is that you can kind of scale it 
horizontally, right? You can just add boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes and more and more computers and just spawn off more processes and you're good to go, right? But then at the same, the flip side of that coin is that, you know, it could get really expensive to use processes whereas if you could save a lot more RAM and, and money by just using threads, for example. Also, you know, if you, if you, in your program, you actually need to spawn threads and processes and not use, you know, some pre-pool of things, you know, that could take more time because spawning a process is more expensive than, than uh, threads. So uh, next up is uh, CSP. So CSP is Communicating Sequential Processes. It's a paper that was written in like the 1970s. You know, uh, someone has told me, you know, everything in computer science was created in the 1970s. Like, since then, it's like, you know, you just repeat, it gets repeated, but everything was created in the 1970s. And um, so, basically, this could use threads or processes. CSP is more of a theoretical paper, um, but nowadays, what is heavily used that is influenced by CSP is Go. And if you um, see that talk uh, that, that I linked with Rob T uh, Pike beforehand and some other talks that he's given, he, he talks a lot about uh, how CSP has influenced, hit, you know, get creating Go, basically. And Go uses channels really heavily, and that's what uh, CSP talks about, is using channels as a, as a way for communication. And you, know, you can see in this example right here, um, it, it's similar to IPC, right? We're using, it's kind of like using a pipe, but you see that construct of a, that arrow. Um, it's saying, oh, send this message, and then when that receiver listens on that, you know, that message, that channel, and then when, it's, when it gets that message, it'll block, and then it'll get that message and continue and do whatever it needs to do. Similar to select and KQ and EPOL and all that stuff. So, uh, so again, the, the advantages to CSP is that you know, you, we're using message passing and channels very heavily. And, and like we have talked about, the ownership concept, it's, it's pretty, there's a lot of advantages to that. Um, and then some disadvantages is that, um, well, I kind of kind of made these up, but you know, I mean, shared data could be simpler to to implement sometimes. I mean, depending on the on the framework that you're using, uh, if you're using something that doesn't have channels as like this first class thing, you know, using and you don't need a complicated concurrency model. You know, sometimes just having some shared memory in a lock is is simpler, and this could be over engineering, right? And then um, there's the issue of if, if you use message passing very heavily you need to deal with big messages, right? If you're sending, or a ton of messages, you either have really, really big messages and your queue is gonna overflow, or you know, you're passing tons and tons of messages like continuously and you're just filling that up as well. And so you have to deal with back pressure, which helps solve these problems, but that's something you need to think of when you, when you do uh, uh, channels. So uh, actors is similar to CSP, and um, again, it uses threads and, and or processes. It's preemptive, and, and it uses message, uh, message passing similar to CSP, but it, it kind of uses the concept of a mailbox. I'm going to give an example, but Erlang, or the Monty Python guy, he, the cellu um, uh, Erlang is basically a, an, an actor language, right? And so in this example, you can see <coughs> we'll have you know, this ping actor and this pong actor, and they're going to communicate with each other by saying, you know, at the very bottom, start ping pong. It'll say async dot dot ping and then you know that will that message will be sent to this mailbox and I'll show you a little diagram that kind of shows it that basically you know this guy is going to send a message to the pong actor and it's going to go in that mailbox and in its own timeline it's going to process the mailbox and say oh I need to ping now or I need to pong now and then when it's done it can either reply with a message or not but all the communication and all the interaction is happening through these mailboxes and this is essentially how how an actor model works and um, yeah, don't communicate by sharing state, share state by communicating, by sending messages to, to mailboxes. So, so back to this example, you can see when we're, when we're doing this, you know, async.ping, it's basically calling, you know, the first, uh, the first actor, and it's sending this ping message uh, to the mailbox, and then in its own timeline, it will do something. And the, what's really, the way I find to understand actors is that it's basically, uh, it's object-oriented threads, really. That's the way I see it, and it, it's nice. It's, it's a nice, kind of concise way to express concurrency. So like I said, it's similar to, to CSP, uh, but the main difference with actors, and, or the kind of way you can compare actors and CSP, is that while CSP communicate over channels, in actors, the identity of the actor is kind of the, the, the concept that you use to communicate. So it's really the, con the it's really the difference is what is kind of the first class way of communicating, and so with CSP it's channels and with actors it's the object oriented thread that you're trying to talk to, or the actor. 
So let's see. Yeah. So so some of the advantages. Again, this is similar to CSP. Um, you know, you use message uh, message passing, which is through mailboxes, um, pretty heavily, which is an alternative to locks because of the whole ownership concept, and that's pretty good. Uh, there's uh, well. There's no, there could be no shared state. I mean, if you have uh, VM processes that don't share memory, then you have the, the advantage of like uh, processes in IPC where you just don't share state and you can't really trip over each other, although you could. Um, and again, the disadvantages are similar to, to CSP. Uh, you know, you have a lot of messages, you have really big messages, that could be a problem. So, so we're going to step into uh, now we're going to step into kind of a, a little bit of a different uh, kind of track. Uh, basically, this is a single-threaded model, right? This is coroutines, and um, coroutines are, you know, if you use Windows, they're fibers. If you use Ruby, they're they're fibers. Um, Python has uh, I forget the name, but a similar uh, similar concept. And this. What's cool about this kind of sidetrack is that we're going to is that it's the cooperative state, right? Up until now, we've done all these preemptive kind of stuff, and um, the cooperative state is cool because again, this is like handing the baton, right? This is Fred, Joe, and Harry, and all those, and they're they're passing around the execution rights, and so you have this executing thing, but really, it's it's just a local stack. This is just like its own context, and you have you know the context of what you're doing. And then you have this other concept, and it's kind of similar to an actor, right? Like you have the pinger and the ponger, and that's those are the things that are in charge of those uh, things that they need to do. But they're but they're actually not an executing thing. They're not a thread. They're just they're just a, a context that's saved. It's just saved local state with the ability to stop and pause at any given time and transfer the baton to someone else and say, now it's your turn to do something. And what's cool about this is that you, you wouldn't think like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting, but not you know, that amazing. But it's, it's kind of amazing that there's a, a guy who created an operating system. He basically built an operating system, a scheduler, just using coroutines. And there's no evented style there or anything. It's, it's literally just coroutines that you know, work with each other, and you have an operating system that, that has a scheduler and all this stuff. And that's um, pretty amazing. I, actually, I think that's pretty amazing. <laughs> you can check out these links. And um, he goes through, it's a course where he'll show you how to implement this whole thing. I think he's in Chicago. Um, so some pros and cons, again, because we have this uh, local context, which is what uh, a coroutine really is, it's really expressive in terms of state because you just pause where you are and then when you uh, continue to execute, you just execute where you left off. And so you don't need to like pass variables and functions and stuff, you just, wherever you are, you continue, right? And you have your local context of the variables and so you just continue from where you were. And um, again, because this is single threaded, there's no need for locks. So, you know, it's cooperative scheduling and so you don't need locks because things aren't going to step over each other because there's only one thing happening at, at any given time. And uh, so this is, scales vertically because if you have a faster CPU, then your you know single executing thread is going to run faster. But really, you know that's kind of a disadvantage because you can't scale it horizontally, right? You can only have one instance of this thing running, and that's why I put on the top, you know, it's it's concurrent. It's definitely concurrent, but it's not. I mean, you can build an operating system with that, but it's not it's not parallel. Right? You can only run one instance of this. You can't run this on a multi-core computer. But the the biggest disadvantage of this really is that you're constrained to have all of these things work together. Because it's cooperative, you know, if, if you have one bad apple, they're all rotten. You know, if you have one thing that's, that's going to uh, get stuck, they're all going to, you know, <laughs> be stuck. So, um, all right, so the, the next one is evented programming, which is uh, similar to coroutines in that it's cooperative, but it's different. And um, instead of using message passing, it uses, uh, shared memory as a way to, to kind of communicate, but it doesn't really communicate because it's similar to, to you know to uh, to coroutines, we're just we just have one single execution that's running, right? And this is again cooperative and similar to coroutines, it's not parallel, right? We only have one instance of this thing running, and so so I'm sure also you guys know you know I mean I'm sure you guys know about all these things, but you know evented programming uh, is is in recent years got a lot of popularity. Um, you know, the whole CTKEN problem, you know, 10,000 concurrent connections, how do we solve that? Uses, you know, evented IO and um, uses the evented programming model. Uh, there's tons of frameworks, you know, twisted in Python, that's, that's evented. Um, Node.js, who is like the hippest language right now, right? Um, that's evented. Even, heck, 20 years ago, you know, Ajax, that's evented. Um, 
so the, the way that uh, this is done is, again, I'm going to kind of try and step through the common building blocks that evented programming uh, frameworks have in common. Um, and then we'll kind of talk about the, the pros and, and cons. So uh, again, we have event handlers and, and callbacks. These are what some of the common ingredients that most frameworks will have. These, these, the event uh, handlers are basically that it's a function or it's a closure that will get invoked when something happens. And so when something happens, we know that we have to run this procedure. And that's what a callback is. That's what an event handler is. And then we'll have a concept usually of a dispatcher, which is essentially kind of um, a registry to hold all those callbacks and say, when something needs to get executed, it'll kind of look up in that registry and see, oh, Justin Bieber is playing on the radio. We should change the station. That's the callback that we've registered. And then you know the data that, that's associated, which is baby, baby, baby. Um, so that's the dispatcher. And then uh, most of these frameworks will also have uh, timers because a major concept of evented programming is you, know, you don't block the event loop, which means that you know, because we have only one executing thing and the whole concept of you know, one bad apple ruins them all, if you have one callback that gets stuck, everything gets stuck. So you can't sleep. So instead of sleeping, you have timeouts, right? And you have, or you have timers. And then when that timeout fires, then you, you, know, you execute that callback. And so JavaScript, which is you know, one of the, the first you know, web kind of async stuff. Um, uses timers and, you know, Twisted uses timers, all this stuff. And uh, then there's the event loop, which is the core of all the evented uh, paradigms. And it's basically just a loop that processes things, right? And you can see, you know, Redis right there, that C code, it has that while, you know, while, don't stop, just keep on going and process all these things. Twisted has a main loop. Every event uh, framework has a, a, a main loop or an event loop. And there are two ways to implement this loop. There is the reactor pattern and there's the proactor pattern. And the, they're both similar. They both want to achieve not blocking the, the, the loop and just continue so that it, it keeps on working uh, you know, seamlessly. The reactor pattern uses usually some methods of you know, the select and epoll and kq and all that stuff to make sure that you know, the readiness effect, right? Like make sure that when you access this data, it's not going to block. The kernel has read all the data from the device. It's copied it into the user level space, and you, you, know, you can just read it off some buffer, and it'll work. And that's the reactor pattern, whereas the proactor pattern is uh, it, it doesn't actually make sure that, the, that it's ready. What it does is you'll have an, an extra callback on top of, of what you've already created that's the completion callback. And so w when something happens, you just immediately execute it in the background. And when that's done, you can pass the result back to the main thread with that completion callback. And Windows completion ports is an example. Um, there's other examples out in the wild. But that's, that's how you implement that main loop. How much time, how much time do I have? Uh, yeah, we're, we're close to the end, so. Um, the, so, th so LibbyV is a pretty you know, common um, framework that's used to build other frameworks. It's written in C uh, by some Russian guy. All the Russians are pretty hard ass. And um, th so this is what, uh, what libEV actually does. But really, to simplify it, what, what it's doing is that it's processing events. When it gets to certain events, it'll look up in that dispatcher or the registry of all the watchers or all the callbacks. There are different, there are different terminologies for, for different frameworks, but that's the idea. And then it will process that either in the proactor way or the reactor way. And that's really what, what evented programming is. And so the, the big advantage of this is that because we're single-threaded and we're using all these like readiness tricks and things like that, we avoid polling. Right? And polling is kind of evil because you know, instead of asking something to say, oh, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? You just, when you're there, you get a notification. Oh, look, you're here. Now what do you want? You want to eat that cookie? Have that cookie. So um, <laughs> yeah, so, so basically you avoid polling. And you're much closer to CPU bound than IO bound, which is a huge win because IO is slow. And right, you're not doing what you don't need to do. You're just doing it at the given time that needs to be executed. And um, actually, you know, if you come from a, a background of you know sequential programming, this could I, I think it's a it's a advantage. Is, you know, async programming is hard to fit in your brain when you're not used to it. It's uh, it's very different. It's a very different way to think of of how you do things. And um, it does. So the kind of last point right there is 
it, it scales, scales well versus threads, but there's a ton of research, you know, saying, well, it actually doesn't, it's not much faster than threads. It's actually pretty similar. But the one place that it kind of does shine in comparison is that when you have a lot of threads, then you have to manage the overhead of having a lot of threads. If you have, you know, 10,000 threads, then whatever's scheduling that needs to make sure that it can run between those threads. Whereas if you have just one single thing that's running, you don't, you don't have that overhead. And so that's why, for example, Nginx, you know, beats uh, Apache, you know, hands down is, is because of that. It doesn't, you know, while Apache forks off a process or responds a thread for every connection, Nginx doesn't do that. It just, it multiplexes, it uses, you know, these select and event loops and all these things. And that's kind of why it scales very well. But, but again, it, it's not necessarily faster, right? Like if you have a low amount of threads, maybe it'll be a lot simpler to use threads and not have the complexity of your async programming log logic. And so that, that kind of leads me to the, the disadvantages is that really, you know, using callbacks is, is kind of hell because you, you lose the context of, of where you came from, right? In sequential pro uh, programming, you have, you know, some function that calls another function, calls another function, and they all build each other on top of a, stock, a stack, and in one, you know, in any function, you can stop and look to see, oh, well, where, where did I come from, right? Where, where was I called from? What's my, my caller stack? Whereas in callbacks, you're lost, right? Like, you know, this thing, this thing happens right now. This function is invoked. I know that this is the, the state of the program. I can check all the variables and see that this is what it is. But I can't, but who called me? Like, I just know that I'm called right now. That's it. And so it's really hard to debug because you lose the stack. And you can get into callback hell, which is kind of a little separate, but also disadvantage of using callbacks because, you, you know, you can just, it's a, it gets kind of messy, right? A callback calling a callback and, and things like that. And so I don't know why I put rely heavily on state as a con, but, um, but that's what you need to do for <laughs> vended programming to kind of find your way around. And also, using languages that have kind of closures or first class functions as, as, a, as a thing, it's probably easier to do. So like if you want to do evented programming in, in languages that don't have that support, it's probably going to be harder to implement because those callbacks are basically functions, right? They're basically closures. So having a framework that enables you to do that, it's going to be easier. And the, the evented kind of approach, uh, like I said, it, you know, uh, Nginx versus uh, Apache, so that's uh, the C take Ken problem. But there's this guy who uh, I found online is talking about, you know, there's this manifesto he put up. It's like, the, uh, why, you know, it's time for the web to handle 10 million concurrent connections now. Like, why don't we do that? Why are we talking about 10,000 connections? And um, it's kind of crazy, but, but he, he, there's this link you can follow uh, as well. And he basically talks about instead of, uh, put, instead of using the kernel as a way to check when something is ready, just push your application into the kernel and make your application a driver, you know? So it's, it's an interesting uh, concept, and you can check out those links. So all things aren't black and white, right? Like, it's, it's easy as a programmer to, to try and to get into a mindset where, you know, this is this, and this is X, and this is Y, and this is the thing that, that needs to happen right now, and, and try to categorize things. And, and actually, that's what this talk is all about, right? I'm trying to, like, fit things into neat little boxes and try and make sure that, oh, this is black, and this is white, and this is this. And, but the reality is, you know, the world isn't, isn't like that. It's not black and white. You know, and as programmers, you can fall into that, pro that thinking of, like, oh, this is, this is the way it needs to be, or something like that. Whereas in reality, you know, different, different tools and different models and different constraints, like, for example, you know, you have constraints of business constraints and things like that. Like, all these different things can lead you into using different things at different times, right? But, but different models shine in different places. And so threads and locks are good for simple use cases. They're also good for, you know, implementing other models. A lot of other models use threads and mutexes in the background. Right? And actors and, and CSP, you know, they, they build telecoms with Erlang and, you know, Golang is doing a ton of stuff that is similar stuff. And uh, whereas the evented model is kind of good for, you know, UI stuff where you're waiting for some keyboard input, for example, and you want to, you don't want to waste resources waiting on something, so when that thing happens, just do it, right? That's kind of GUI programming is very uh, evented. That's why browsers and JavaScript kind of work. So really, you know, it's about, it's about using the, uh, the best tool for the job. And again, like the constraints of your, your life and your business and whatever you're doing, you know, you have to find what's right for you. There is no best or worst or model thing like that, you know? Because you don't want to be stuck in that situation. So. 
so yeah, and I think I think the the most important really thing of it all is is all these different models can really you know expand your brain and and really the point of this talk was to try and get you to start thinking. This isn't a comprehensive kind of list of all the things, but it's enough to kind of you know get your brain juices flowing and being like, oh, you know, I want to. I, that sounds interesting. I want to look more into that. And I'm by no means, a, you know, the, the world expert on the matter. So I'd be interested in you guys teaching me what you know, because I'm, I'm definitely, you know, on the, just, just learning, just learning this stuff. So um, that's it. Thank you. So questions? Something I didn't see on your list was data flow programming. Yeah. Oh, you, you did see that. No, I didn't. Did, was it there? Oh, yeah. It was, it was in the futures and promises kind of, uh, uh, yeah. It, it uses data flow programming is, is kind of a way to structure your programming language to kind of flow according to the data that, that like, you link data together and then you kind of flows according to that. And it uses futures and promises very heavily. Data flow is, uses futures and promises. So it's a little larger than just uh, concurrency because it's a larger context. But it, yeah, it, it kind of falls into that category. So yeah. um, just by the way, we did tweet a link to those slides. I mean, you weren't supposed to read everything along during that. Like What's that? I tweeted a link to your slides. So oh, yeah. Um, you weren't supposed to follow everything along as he was going. Like, that's a lot of cross references for you to check out later. Yeah, there's a, lo a lot of references, and there's a lot of links. And uh, uh, maybe I can just go back to the, uh, to the link, and you guys can just see it while they switch. Yeah. So you can pull that up. Any other questions? Michael. Hi. Um, what's the largest uh, production concurrency stuff that you've run, and what language? Oh, what do I do, basically? Oh, what's the What's the largest production system? What's the largest concurrently concurrent evented production system that you've run, and what language? Well, we don't run actually a lot of evented stuff at Engine Yard, but we do use some frameworks. For example, we have, you know, similar GitHub has like a similar kind of bot that they do, you know, stuff. And essentially, how big? Uh, not very big. It's internal system stuff, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. okay. We're good. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.